So in this lecture, I will discuss uh, some applications of the weak convergence. So I will present two results. The first one, you recall that we represent by C minus 1, 1, the space of continuous functions F from minus 1, 1 to R with uh, the soup norm. And we know, so if I call this space x, so, uh, or maybe, yeah, x prime is the space which I, I will call m, and this is the space of uh, measures, which are uh, signed, so they may take negative values. They are finite. And they are defined on the Borel sigma field. It's known from measure theory that if you have a signed measure mu, you can decompose it in a positive part and in a negative part. So any signed measure can be decomposed as a positive measure minus a non-negative or positive measure. And the norm of mu will be given by the total uh, variation of this measure, which is mu plus of minus 1, 1 plus mu minus minus 1, 1. So these are the objects. And what I want to discuss in this first application is that, well, consider Fn an element of C. So it's a sequence of continuous functions. I will define mu n dt to be fn t dt. So this is the absolutely continuous measure with respect to the Lebesgue measure whose density it's given by fn. And I want to um, investigate the convergence of the sequence of measures in the weak star topology to the Dirac measure concentrated on uh, zero. So here, delta zero of, so delta zero, it's a measure defined on the Borel sigma algebra. And delta zero of A, of an element A, a subset of minus 1, 1, which is Borel measurable. This is equal to 1 if zero belongs to A. And it's a zero otherwise, so if zero does not belong to A. And what I want to present is necessary and sufficient condition for this convergence to occur. And just remember that saying that mu n converges to delta 0 in the weak star sense, here we are talking about convergence, weak star convergence in m, which is the dual of x. So this means that mu n of g converge to delta 0 of g for all g in c or in x, so the space of continuous function, which means that since mu n is given by uh, this expression, this is equivalent to require that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of g t f and t dt converge to the integral of g with respect to delta 0, but the integral of g with respect to uh, this Dirac measure is just g of 0. So weak star convergence of mu n to delta 0, where mu n is given by uh, this expression, it's equivalent to say that for any function, continuous function in minus 1, 1 g, the integral of g times fn is converging to g of 0. And um, in the next blackboard, I will introduce necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, this limit to occur. So the first theorem I want to prove in this lecture is the following one. Recall x 
is the space of continuous functions defined in the interval minus 1, 1. Now consider a, a sequence of functions fn in this space. And I'm interested in the convergence of the integral of fn times g. Then I'm saying, I'm providing here necessary and sufficient conditions for the integral from minus 1 to 1 of g times fn to converge to g of 0 for any continuous function g. And I'm saying that, well, this limit occurs if and only if the three following conditions are matched. The first one is that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of fn converge to 1. The second one is that for any function g which has infinitely many derivatives and whose derivatives are continuous, so this is the space infinity, and such that 0 does not belong to the support of g, then the integral of fn times g converge to 0. And here, recall, the support of the function g is defined as follows. You consider the points x in minus 1, 1, such that g of x is different from 0. So g, it's a continuous function. So this is an open set. And you close this open set. You call that the support. So I'm assuming that if 0 does not belong to the support of g, then the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f and g converge to 0. And finally, the third condition states that there exists a finite constant C0 such that the L1 norm of fn is uniformly bounded by that constant, which means that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of the absolute value of fn is bounded by um, this constant C0. So I claim that, well, this limit occurs for all functions or continuous function g if and only if these three conditions are satisfied. So let me start by uh, proving one direction, proving the three conditions are sufficient to guarantee this convergence. Or um, now maybe let me do proceeding the other way around. Yeah, which is easier. Let me assume that this uh, occurs, and then let me prove that the three conditions are satisfied. So I'm assuming that for any continuous function g, I have this convergence. Well, A, it's obviously satisfied because A, it's exactly to take the function g equal to 1. If I take the function g equal to 1, this becomes the integral of fn. And since g is equal to 1, g of 0 is 1. And this is what A is establishing. So A is satisfied whenever this condition occurs. So now let's prove B. Well, let's consider a function g, which is infinity. And let's assume that 0 does not belong to the support of g. Well, g is continuous, so I can apply uh, this result. And this result tells me that uh, this integral is converging to g of 0. But since 0 does not belong to the support of g, g of 0 is 0. And therefore, this condition is also trivially satisfied. So the only problem is to uh, prove condition C. And for that, maybe you, you can try. Maybe you should stop now uh, this uh, video and try to prove by yourself that uh, this third condition is satisfied. Let me give you uh, the solution. The solution is, uh, follows from one of the theorems I proved in the last lecture. This, what is this saying? Well, this is saying that mu n dt, which is defined as f n t dt, that mu n, this measure, which is a sine measure with finite total mass defined on the Borel sigma algebra, that this measure is converging in the weak star sense to uh, the measure delta 0. 
by converging to, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, requiring that this measure converge in the weak star sense to the measure delta zero means that the integral of a continuous function g with respect to mu n converge to delta zero, and this is exactly what this is saying. So mu n, it's converging in the weak star sense to delta zero, and this, we know that weak star convergence entails that this sequence it's uniformly bounded. So we know that there exists C0 such that the norm of mu n, it's uniformly bounded by C0. But what's the norm of a sign measure? The norm of a sign measure, it's mu n plus of minus 1, 1. plus mu n minus of minus 1, 1. So here I'm using the Han-Jordan decomposition of a sign measure into its positive part minus its negative part. And the norm, it's given by the total mass of the positive part plus the total mass of the negative part. Well, but what is mu n? Mu n is defined here. So I know exactly what is the Han-Jordan decomposition of this measure mu n. The positive part, which I'm representing by mu n with the plus sign below or above as it is, this is the positive part is just taking the positive part of the function, the continuous function fn. So this is just fn plus t dt where fn plus is the positive part. So what is fn plus? fn plus is fn maximum 0. So it's 0 if fn is negative, and it's if fn if fn is positive. And in the same way, the negative part of this measure, mu n minus dt, it's the negative part of Fn, so Fn minus is equal to minus Fn maximum zero. This means that if at some point Fn is negative, then this is becomes positive, and therefore Fn minus it's minus Fn, so it's a positive number. And if Fn is positive, this is negative, and therefore fn minus is equal to 0. So we know exactly what are. So the total mass of mu n plus is the total mass of this measure. And the total mass of this measure is the integral from minus 1 to 1 of fn plus. So this is equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of fn plus t dt plus minus 1, 1 fn minus t dt. The sum of these two, the sum of the positive part with the negative part, it's just the absolute value of the function. So this is equal to minus 1, 1, the absolute value of fn t dt. And uh, we know that this norm, it's uniformly bounded by, by c0. So this is exactly saying that the integral of the absolute value of f and t is bounded by this constant, and this is the third condition. So you see that the third condition, the first two are trivial, the third one follows from a theorem which we proved uh, on weak star convergence. And it will be, if you try to prove it directly, uh, you'll suffer a little bit. So up to now, we proved that if the condition on the left-hand side is satisfied, then the three conditions on the right-hand side are satisfied. And the next step is to prove that if these three conditions are satisfied, then we have this convergence, and this is my next step. So now let me prove um, that these three conditions imply that convergence. So I'm proving the converse 
of uh, the previous statement. So let's assume that A, B, C are satisfied. Let me prove this. First, uh, so I'll do that step by step. My first claim is that it's enough to prove that this convergence holds for all G in X such that G of 0 is equal to 0. So I'm saying that if I prove, if I assume that this, is, this hasn't proved for continuous functions which are 0 at 0, then this holds for all functions, f. And this is clear. Take a function h, a continuous function h. Define g of t as h of t minus h of 0. So now, g, it's a continuous function. And g of 0, it's equal to 0. Since I assumed that the result holds for all continuous functions which are 0 at 0, it holds for this function g. So I know that the integral of from minus 1 to 1 of f and t, g of t, dt, converge to g of 0. This is by my first assumption. But g of 0, it's clear it's equal to 0. What is g? g is h minus 0. So what we know is that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f and t h t minus h 0 dt, it's converging to 0. So we deduce that from this, this limit, this assertion, because g is h minus h t of minus h 0. Now, by linearity, this tells me that the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f and t h t dt, so this is the first piece, minus h 0, the integral from minus 1, 1 f and t dt. So this is converging to 0 by the previous uh, fact. Now, if I use a, a tells me that this integral is converging to 1. If this integral is converging to 1 and this difference is converging to 0, this means that the integral of fn h is converging to h0. And this is exactly what I wanted to prove. I wanted to prove that the integral of fn h converges to h of 0. So what I just showed is that if the result holds for continuous functions which are 0 at 0, then it holds for all continuous functions. Now, so we proved that if this result holds for all functions g which are 0 at 0, then it holds for all continuous functions. Now, what I claim is that if this result holds for all continuous functions, so which are 0, not at 0, but on a slight interval around 0, then it holds for all functions which are 0 at 0. So what I claim is that suppose that it holds for all function g for which there exists a delta such that j um, x or g t is equal to 0 for all t less or equal than delta. Then what I claim is that, so now my claim is assume that this limit holds for all continuous functions with this property is that there exists a strictly positive delta such that g of t is equal to 0 for all t bounded in absolute value by delta, then it holds for all continuous functions which are 0 at 0. So let's consider. So fix a function g which is continuous and such that g of 0 is equal to 0. And let me prove that the result holds for this function by assuming that it holds 
for this class of functions. Well, you know that since g it's um, so let me fix an epsilon positive. And since g it's continuous, we know it's uniformly continuous. So we know that there exists a strictly positive delta such that if t minus s it's bounded by delta, then gt minus g of s it's bounded by epsilon. As the function g is continuous, it's uniformly continuous. And this means that I can find, given epsilon, I can find a delta such that if the difference is bounded by delta, then the difference of g is bounded by epsilon. So what I will do is the following. I will construct a function g of epsilon, which satisfies this property, and which is close to the function g. So how do I construct this function? The construction is uh, very easy. Here is the interval minus 1, 1. Here is 0. So I know that my function g is 0 at 0. I get, I consider an interval of size delta around 0. I'm constructing the function g of epsilon. I declare it to be 0 in this interval. So this function will satisfy uh, this condition. Well, <coughs> since my function g satisfies this bound, what I know is that in this interval minus delta delta, since g of 0 is 0, this means that g of t is bounded by epsilon in this interval. So g takes value somewhere here, where in this rectangle, this value is epsilon, and this value is minus epsilon. So I know that in this interval minus delta delta, g is a continuous function, which is 0 at 0 and takes value inside this rectangle. So at delta, this function is somewhere here, and maybe it's here at minus delta. And since it's a continuous function, well, it just do something on the right of delta and on the left of minus delta. So the definition, so I want g of epsilon to be 0 in this interval. And what I will do is that at delta, on the right to delta, I will just follow exactly the trajectory of g, but with uh, this difference. So I'll keep the difference between g and the function I'm constructing, which I'm calling g delta, constant. So the function will be something like that here. And the same thing here, it's, so it will be 0, and it will follow the function g on the left of this interval. So this means, so by construction, what I get are twofold. First, g of epsilon s, it's equal to 0 for s between minus delta and delta. And then the difference, what I claim is that the difference of g epsilon s and g s, so that this difference is bounded by epsilon for all epsilon between minus, for all s between minus 1 and 1. And why is that so? Well, because in, if s belongs to the interval minus delta delta, g epsilon is 0. And g takes the value inside this rectangle, which is bounded by minus epsilon and epsilon. So this result holds if s belongs to minus delta delta. And then, since this difference is bounded by epsilon and it's continuous to the right, and since this difference is bounded by epsilon and this distance is continuous to the left, this inequality also holds for s outside the interval minus delta, delta. So I constructed a continuous function. This function is clearly continuous because while well, it's continuous in minus delta, delta, closed, it's continuous in between delta and 1 for the closed interval, for the closed interval here. So the function defined between minus 1, 1, it's closed. So I get a function g epsilon, which is continuous. 
it's zero between minus delta and delta, and its distance to g, it's bounded by epsilon for all s. This function g epsilon satisfies these uh, conditions, so by assumption, the limit holds for g epsilon. So I know by assumption, uh, I need some space here, so I hope you understood the definition of my function. So now by assumption, I know that the integral of f and t g epsilon t dt, that this converge to g epsilon of 0, which is 0, as n goes to infinity. Because g epsilon satisfies this condition. Now let's consider the original function g. And what I claim is that the difference between this integral and the integral with respect to g epsilon t, that this is small. So I know that uh, for any epsilon, this converges to 0. And what I claim is that this difference is small. Indeed, by linearity of the integral, it's bounded by uh, the integral from minus 1 to 1 of f and t g epsilon t minus g t dt. But this quantity, g epsilon, this difference, g epsilon t minus g t, it's bounded by epsilon. So this is bounded by epsilon times minus 1, 1, the integral of the absolute value of f and t. And this, by condition c, it's bounded by c. So this is bounded by epsilon c. So we just proved that uniformly in n, this difference is bounded by epsilon times c. Since as n goes to infinity, this integral converges to 0, this means that this one, the limit of this one, it's bounded by epsilon c. And since epsilon is arbitrary, this means that this integral is converging to 0, and this is exactly what we wanted to prove. So I just showed that if the result is true, so if we are able to prove this convergence for functions g, which are 0 in the neighborhood of the origin, then it holds for functions which are 0 at the origin. And we proved before that then it holds for any continuous function. So actually, it's enough to prove that a, b, and c guarantee this convergence for functions g, which are 0 in the neighborhood of 0. So up to now, I proved that it's enough to show that a, b, and c entail that for all functions, continuous function g, for which there exists a strictly positive delta, such that g of t is equal to 0 for delta less than delta, then this limit holds. If we can prove that for such functions, then we can prove this limit for any continuous function. So what I will do now is to show that if a, b, and c holds, then this condition holds. So I'm proving that a, b, and c guarantee that. So let's fix such a function. So we have a function defined in minus 1, 1. And this function is 0 in the neighborhood of the origin. So what I want to use is b, this condition b, which has not been used. So I want to approximate that function g by smooth functions. And to approximate that function g by smooth functions, what I will do is to use some convolution of this function. So to use convolution, let me fix a function phi from r to r. And I will assume that, well, this phi is a smooth function. So this is what's called an approximation of the identity. So let me tell you what an approximation of the identity is. So it is smooth. 
it's positive. Let's say that it has compact support in minus 1, 1. So if t is larger than 1, then phi of t is 0. And finally, I will need the integral of phi to be 1. Right? So I want phi to be a smooth function, which means with infinitely many derivatives, to be non-negative, to have compact support, say in the interval minus 1, 1, and to have an integral equal to 1. So the function phi looks something like, doesn't need to be symmetric, but I'll represent it uh, symmetrically, so it's something like that, which has an uh, integral equal to 1. And once uh, this function is smooth, I will consider versions of this function in the sense that I'll fix an epsilon positive, and phi epsilon of t will be so I'll change the scale, and I want to reduce minus 1, 1 to an interval minus epsilon, epsilon. So I want to scale this function, and this function will look something like that, because I'll, it will still be smooth. The total integral will be 1, and the support will be now contained between minus epsilon and epsilon. So the way in we do that, it's just by dividing t by epsilon, and now I divide this function by 1 over epsilon. So it's still smooth because phi is smooth. It's non-negative because phi is non-negative. Now it's 0. So you see that this function, it's non-zero if t minus epsilon is bounded by 1. So for phi epsilon, t is bounded by epsilon. So this means that the support of phi epsilon is now the interval minus epsilon epsilon. And if you integrate phi with respect to dt, you change variables, and you get that the integral of phi uh, epsilon is still equal to 1. So this condition holds for all epsilon, and now this condition is changed for t larger than epsilon. So now we have a family of smooth functions whose support is contained in between minus epsilon and epsilon. This means that the function it's equal to 0 outside this interval minus epsilon, epsilon. Now let's consider the convolution of g. So let me call g epsilon. The convolution of phi epsilon with g. So by definition, g of epsilon at the point t, and for that, what I will do is, g is a continuous function. It takes some value at 1. I will just extend the definition of g to plus infinity, taking it to be constant. So maybe g at minus 1 has some value. So I just extend its definition to minus infinity minus 1, taking it to be constant. And this will be um, the integral in r of phi epsilon s g t minus s ds. So this is the convolution of phi epsilon with g. I'm just integrating g with respect to phi epsilon. So I want, um, of course, this is equal by changing variables. It's also the same thing as phi epsilon t minus s g of s ds. So my first remark is that uh, g of epsilon is smooth. So it's a continuous function. So with this definition, by extending the function g of epsilon, it's actually defined between minus infinity and plus infinity. So it's a, and it's smooth because phi is smooth. So I can take as many derivatives with respect to t as I wish. And if I take now the restriction of g of epsilon to the interval minus 1, 1, I get a function which is c infinity and defined in interval minus 1, 1, which is exactly what I want here. 
So my first observation is that for any positive epsilon, g epsilon, it's a smooth function. And also, by this remark, you see that in defining g epsilon of t, I will just consider the values of s for which this is positive. So this integral can be reduced actually to the interval minus epsilon epsilon. So the values of g which are important to define g epsilon of t are those which are at distance epsilon from t. In particular, if I take epsilon smaller than delta, and if this is epsilon, so this point here is delta minus epsilon, what you see is that the function in this interval, so in the interval between minus delta minus epsilon and delta minus epsilon, this function is 0. Because if I take a point here, and I want to define g epsilon of t, the values of g which matter in this integral are those which are distance epsilon. And all those are contained in the interval minus delta delta, in which g is equal to 0 by assumption. So this means that g epsilon t is equal to 0 for t bounded by delta minus epsilon. So if I take epsilon strictly smaller than delta, I have a function g epsilon, which is smooth, and such that the distance uh, and such which, are, which is equal to 0 in an interval. So this function epsilon g epsilon for epsilon smaller than delta satisfies this assumption. right? It's a smooth, and 0 does not belong to the support because, well, g epsilon is 0 in an interval containing the origin. So we know, by assumption, that the integral of fn with respect to g epsilon converges to 0. We will use this fact and the fact that g epsilon is close to g to conclude uh, the argument. So the third claim is that we proved that g epsilon is smooth, that g epsilon is 0 in a neighborhood of the origin, now my third claim is that g epsilon is close to g. So I want to compare g epsilon t with g t. And for that, I will again use the fact that g, uh, which we started from, it's a continuous function. So if g is a continuous function, so fix eta positive, since g is continuous, it's uniformly continuous. This means that there exists um, a positive such that if t minus s is bounded by a, then g t minus g s is bounded by eta. So for because g is continuous, it's uniformly continuous, which means that for any eta, I can find a such that if t minus s is bounded by a, then gt minus gs is bounded by eta. So now let's take epsilon smaller than this a, which we obtained, and let's compare g epsilon t minus gt in absolute value. Here is the definition of g epsilon t. So I have to take that. So if I want to compare g epsilon t minus g t out g of t here, but now remember the integral of phi epsilon is equal to one. So this is equal to the integral over r of phi epsilon s g t minus s minus g t. And in this integral, since the support of phi epsilon is contained in uh, minus epsilon epsilon, I can reduce this integral from minus epsilon to epsilon. This means that 
S, the absolute value of S is bounded by epsilon. This means that this quantity here, since S is bounded by epsilon, it's bounded by A. And GT minus GS for two points which are distance A, it's bounded by epsilon eta. So the absolute value of this quantity, it's bounded by eta. So the absolute value of this quantity, it's bounded by phi epsilon, it's positive. So it's bounded by the integral of phi epsilon times the absolute value of the difference. But the absolute value of the difference, it's bounded by eta. Eta, it's a constant, goes out from the integral. So I get eta times the integral of phi epsilon. But we have seen that the integral of phi epsilon, it's 1. So this is bounded by eta. So we just proved that for any t, the distance between g epsilon t and g t is bounded by eta, provided we take um, epsilon smaller than that function a. And with that, we can conclude uh, the argument. So I have a third, I just proved the third property here, which is, so we know one, two, and now a third property is that for all eta, there exists uh, a, so a is strictly positive, so that if epsilon is smaller than a, then g epsilon minus g infinity it's bounded by eta. Now I can consider that uh, limit. I want to prove that this limit holds for this type of function g. I take a function g, so which is continuous and satisfying this condition. I define, so I fix uh, eta positive. For that, Function g, I define g epsilon, as I did. So I get a smooth function which vanish in the neighborhood of the origin, provided I choose epsilon small enough, and such that this inequality holds. So I define g epsilon. I take epsilon, which at the same time it's bounded by a, and it's bounded by delta. So the function g epsilon now satisfy condition 2 and 3 simultaneously. And I compare the integral from minus 1, 1, f and t, g, t, dt, which is what I want to show that converts to 0, and compare that to the integral of f and t, g epsilon t, dt, for the function which I just constructed. The function which I just construct, well, I know on one hand, this is bounded by minus 1, 1, the absolute value of nt times the absolute value of gt minus g epsilon t. gt minus g epsilon t is bounded by eta, and the integral of fn the L1 norm of Fn is bounded by C0. So this is bounded by C0 times eta. This comes from condition C. Now, if I consider this, the second term, g epsilon, it's a smooth function. It vanishes in the neighborhood of the origin, and therefore 0 does not belong to its support. Therefore, I can apply this by b. I know that this expression is converging to 0 for all epsilon small enough, epsilon smaller than delta and epsilon smaller than a. From that, what I get is that the limit of f and t g t is bounded by c0 times eta. This eta is arbitrary, so this is telling me that this limit is equal to 0. And therefore, I get uh, the result which I wanted, which is that if g is a continuous function, and if it vanishes in the neighborhood of the origin, 
then this limit holds. And we proved before that if this limit holds for these type of functions, then it holds for any continuous functions. And this proves finally that A, B, and C entails this convergence for all continuous function G. So that proves uh, the theorem I wanted to, I, to present to you. Uh, this theorem has a name, it's called Toeplitz Toplitz theorem. So let me write it uh, somewhere here. Toplitz theorem. And, um, and it, since this is, these are necessary and sufficient conditions for these limits to hold for all continuous function, if one of these conditions fails, it means that this condition fails. This condition fails means that there exists a G, a continuous function G, for which this limit doesn't hold. So if A, B, or C, so let me repeat it, if A, B, or C fails, and I will use that in the next example, in which the condition C fails, so if the condition C fails, since these are necessary and sufficient condition, this means that there exists a function G for which this limit doesn't hold. And I will use that in uh, my next example. So I want to apply the previous result to investigate the convergence of a Fourier series. series. So let me tell you what I have in mind. I have F, a, say a continuous function, in, which is defined in R. And it's periodic, so this means that f t plus 2 pi is equal to f of t for all t. And we know that we can express these uh, functions in a Fourier in a Fourier series, but I won't go very much into this. I just want to define a n as 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus n, minus pi to pi, of ft exponential minus uh, e n t dt. And that will be here n, it's an integer. So this is well defined because f is a continuous function, and this one it's a smooth function. And what we would like to, to say, so the Fourier expansion of this function f, it's to say that well f theta or f t is in some sense equal to the sum in j of a j, so j belongs to z, exponential e j theta. So in some sense, uh, you would like to say that you can express f theta in these terms. I won't uh, discuss this representation. What I want to discuss is the following. I want to take n, fix n, and discuss the convergence of this series, so now I'm taking the sum, let me write it some other way, that sum from j from minus n to n, and that this expression converge to f of theta, and more specifically, I want to the convergence at theta equal to zero, so I would like uh, to discuss, if you take theta equal to zero, this becomes one, this is zero. And what I want to prove is that there exists a continuous function f for which this uh, limit does not hold. So what I want to show to you now by using the previous theorem is that there exists a continuous function f for which this sum does not converge to f of zero. 
So I won't, and this is um, non-explicit, uh, we won't construct, it's not a constructive theorem. I will just use the previous result to show that there exists at least one continuous function for which d sum does not converge to f0. So if you are acquainted with a Fourier series, what we are showing is that there exists at least a continuous function for which uh, the Fourier series does not converge point-wisely at one point. So I just rewrote what, um, what we want to do. We have a continuous function. If you fix a continuous function defined on the real line, taking real or complex values, you assume that it's periodic and with period 2 pi. So f t plus 2 pi is equal to f of t for any t. And you define the Fourier coefficients of this function, ag. So aj is the integral from minus pi to pi divided by 2 pi of f with respect to exponential minus ijt. Now, with that aj, you want to define formally uh, this sum. So you fix n, and you define the function fn of theta as the sum of aj exponential ej theta and you would like to uh, say that this uh, function converges to f of theta. And what uh, I want to show here is that there exists a continuous function f, so f is a continuous function, for which this convergence does not hold at theta equal to zero. So this convergence, if you take theta to be zero, you see that this is one, so this is exactly saying that the sum of aj from j from minus n to n does not converge to f of 0. Well, let me write what aj is to see what we want to show. We want to show that the sum from minus n to n of aj, but aj is 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi, of f theta exponential minus i j theta d theta. So I want to show that this does not converge to f of 0. But, well, by linearity, I can write that as minus pi pi of f theta f t j n t d t, where j n gn, it's equal to the sum in j from minus n to n of 1 over 2 pi exponential minus i j t. So you see that this is a continuous function. And what we want uh, to prove is that this sequence does not converge to f of 0. Well, f is a continuous function. gn is a sequence of continuous function. So we are exactly in the context of the previous theorem and where we obtain three necessary and sufficient conditions for which um, this convergence takes place. So if I prove that <coughs> minus pi to pi of g n t d t is not bounded. So there exists a subsequence n k. Actually, we will prove that, which converge to plus infinity. This means that condition c of the previous theorem does not hold. And if condition C does not hold, it means that there exists a continuous function f such that, well, this limit, which is this limit, doesn't hold. So it's enough to prove that um, this integral converges to plus infinity to show the existence of such a continuous function. And observe that the proof is not constructive we are not exhibiting this function f for which this limit does not hold. We are just claiming that there exists a continuous function for which 
this limit does not hold. So what remains to be done is to consider that function g and t, which is give, given by this sum, and to show that its uh, L1 norm converges to plus infinity. So we have here, so these are computation, 1 over 2 pi, a sum from j minus n to n of exponential minus i j t. So this is a geometric sum. You can compute it explicitly. And if you compute it explicitly, what you get is that, uh, and I leave it to you to check, that this is equal to sinus of n plus 1 half of t divided by sinus t divided by 2. So I leave it to you to check um, that this sum and there is 1 over 2 pi. Um, well, this is a geometric sum, so it's easy uh, to compute it. And so I leave it to you to compute it and to check that it's equal to this uh, ratio. So what we want to estimate is the integral from minus pi to pi of the absolute value of sinus n plus 1 half t divided by sinus of t divided by 2 absolute value dt. Fine. But now, uh, of course, sinus x divided by x in absolute value that this is bounded by a constant for all x in R, or for all x between minus pi to pi. And this is clear because, well, sine of x at 0 behaves as x. And otherwise, between minus pi and pi, it, um, well, at pi, you have the same information. And between sine, it's strictly positive, and so you don't have uh, any problem in proving that inequality. So since sinus x divided by x, it's bounded by a constant for x bounded by pi, I can here um, bound this expression, dividing and multiplying that by x over by t over 2. Well, this one, it's bounded. Below, therefore, it's bounded above by a constant. And here I have over 2, which I'm including in this constant, by minus pi pi, now sinus n plus 1 half t. And this is dt divided by t. Now you perform a change of variables. Maybe let me call that theta. Then, uh, and of course, I can here, OK, it doesn't matter, so I won't do it. So when I change variables, since I have dt divided by t here, um, nothing changed. And while here, when t takes the value pi, theta takes the value n plus 1 pi. So this is minus n plus 1 half. This is pi times n plus 1 half of sinus theta, and then d theta divided by theta. So you see, sinus, when you take the function sinus in 0, pi 2 pi and so on. If you remove a slight interval around 0 pi and 2 pi, you get something which is strictly positive if you take the absolute value sign. So by removing these small intervals, you get something here which is strictly positive, while the integral of 1 over theta of dt diverge as logarithmic. So it's not difficult to show that this is actually bounded by a constant divided by the log of n. Uh, 
and this is converging to plus infinity. Okay, so I leave it to you to check that this inequality holds. As I told you, well, you may remove, since this is uh, positive, you remove from this integral small intervals around pi to pi and so on. Once you do that, sinus becomes strictly bounded below by a strictly positive constant, and it remains this integral, which is essentially integral from 0 to pi times n, in which we remove these uh, small intervals, but, well, the value, the asymptotic value of this quantity, removing these uh, small intervals, is essentially is the same as the asymptotic value of the full integral, and the full integral is just log n. So here there's an argument that I leave it to you to show that this is bounded. But once you have that, you conclude that the integral of the absolute value of g and t diverge as log of n. Therefore, it's not bounded. And this is what we wanted to, to show. And our conclusion is that there exists a continuous function f for which the uh, Fourier series at one point does not converge uh, point wisely.